right, well, um, I've got Jacob Hanshu back. Um, he is now working on his PhD in anthropology at, the, at Washington University in St. Louis. He was at the University of Nottingham, but he's got that all finished up now. Um, and he's going to help sort out a few things from the fourth part of the Enchantments of Mammon. So we're getting back into this book after a little bit of a excursus into Marxism. Um, and this part of the book, the fourth part, is dealing with developments in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in the United States. Um, but a lot of this, um, chapter 14 in particular in this uh, part, has to do with the arts and crafts movement, right? And their attempt to, in their, their perception that um, mechanization and capitalism had had led to disenchantment or or at least to the you know the deadening and alienation of work and mccarra hair treats this movement as an attempt at re-enchantment of sorts uh, an attempt to bring back a sort of sacramental nature to work and and a sense of beauty which he depicts as um, kind of an attempt to bring God's spirit back into the world or to become closer to God through beauty. And I, I just wondering what you thought of the arts and crafts movement. We know it ultimately didn't succeed and we can talk about that more in a minute, but I mean, like, what do you think of their notion of work and beauty? Yeah. Well, and I know in these chapters, he is also very concerned with the arts and crafts movement, like in the U.S., which I know next to nothing about. So, uh, if somebody knows more, uh, you know, I totally stand corrected. If I'm glossing from from Rustin I mean, and Forrest, I the, hardly in, didn't. I hardly knew anything about it before reading this book either. I'm not that great uh, with American history myself, so we're both in the right. same boat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I. But I mean, like I, we kind of talked about before is, I think that the arts and crafts movement made somewhat of a mistake. And I would also say that this played into, and I know you said we'd talk about this later, but this plays into the reason why it failed and to why it was able to be swept up, you know, into, uh, you know, the market, which is kind of, I mean, not, not necessarily the market, but like industrial capitalism, which is the very thing which it set out to contest. Mm -hmm. And that is that rather than emphasizing care or workmanship or anything like that, it emphasized beauty, right? Which to, it, to me, this is problematic because beauty, right? Like, like if you disconnect beauty from care, beauty from workmanship, um, you know, Richard Sennett talks about, uh, what, what does he say? Like the reconnection of the hand and the head, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, or, or Marx, Marx's notion of like, you know, his 1844 manuscripts, uh, alienation from our species being, right? Mm -hmm. So the arts and crafts movement, I think, started out on this leg. Um, and I would say that, you know, Morris and Ruskin, uh, this is part of their whole project. But in America, at least from what I take of McHare Hare's understanding of this is that he says that the, the arts and crafts movement in America instead emphasized beauty um, and, and the creation of beautiful objects as opposed to this like workmanship or mm -hmm. the labor of it, right? So if you have a beautiful chair um, that is still produced by an exploited laborer, this is fine, which to me falls short uh, well, would I would they honestly say that though? I don't know if they, you know, if the advocates of the movement would. I mean, the beauty was tied up with this this notion of like personal craftsmanship that you couldn't have. Well, I think I picked up on this idea that that beauty can't be mass manufactured; that it has to come from creativity somehow i mean is that fair I, that's that's where like i don't know and this is where i should probably like read more on this because mm -hmm. to me it seemed like right um 
I guess, right? Um, and, and it might be, right, that, that workmanship and beauty are linked, right? But I guess I, I don't think that you can make the assumption, right, that beautiful objects always come from, uh, you know, really careful workmanship, which... I, I, I yeah. hear you. I think that's true. I, I mean, that's correct, that, that beauty doesn't have to come from craftsmanship. I think... I think some of them, some of them thought it did, right? But I think the the observation that you're you're making proves that beauty as an emphasis is not. It doesn't work as well as they as they thought it did, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And if you and if you, um, I guess if you choose to emphasize beauty because right, it's related to this you know, intimate craftsmanship or species being or whatever, you know, like mm -hmm. this non-alienated labor, then my question would be why the emphasis is on beauty and not on one of these things, right? Right, yeah. Well, why, you know, what, let's sort of think about this a bit. So what is it about beauty that the arts and crafts folks would have would have thought liberating or you know i mean what was it partly about the ordinary people were were you know the type of surroundings that people were living in post industrial revolution were more more and more dismal for ordinary people mm -hmm. right in these big cities so maybe this was part of it was that you know maybe they envisioned that previously when people lived in more of a pastoral setting they were surrounded by beauty, but now in the big right. city. And, you know, so therefore human beings need to recreate beauty around them to humanize. I'm just trying to figure out why there would be this emphasis. Yeah. I mean, from my understanding, I guess that's kind of it. Like, you know, we have all these shoddy products um, that are ugly, right? Not only are they poorly made, right, but they're also terrible to look at. Like, does anybody actually enjoy, I mean, to use like a contemporary example, does anybody actually enjoy looking at like a Walmart box store? Mm. Um, I mean, <laughs> right. So, um, there, and I mean that, that moves into architecture instead of like, right, like goods, I guess. But yeah, I, I don't know. And part of this is right. Um, like having 2020 hindsight, um, mm -hmm. for example, like, uh, was it, I think it was, was it William Morris? The one who made like, he was, he was doing, he did textiles and wallpaper and all this. I think, I think it was, uh, Morris, but he like had this press that he ran that produced like these beautiful, like super ornate books. Okay. Um, but one only rich people could afford them mm -hmm. Two, his operation was like explicitly capitalist in that he was a capitalist who hired wage labor. Right. Mm -hmm. And the question here would be like, right. Can, I mean, and it, and it could also be right that I'm a little bit um, tending more towards like Marx, uh, which Morris was a not non Marxist uh, socialist. Right. But I mean, I mean, can you have non alienated labor in a capitalist setting? And this, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know the answer to this question, but, I mean, but this might be part actually, of it. That's a big question. I, yeah, I mean, I think about this question a lot. I partly because I really like the idea of, of more, I hate the term, but intentional community. And oftentimes that goes along with like some sort of crafty type of enterprise. Right. And for instance, there's one uh, that I, I get a magazine from the, the Bruderhof community. I don't know if you've heard of them. I haven't. What? Okay. Well, they have an outpost or two in the United States and then they have different communities elsewhere in the world. Um, and they are Christians and they have, um, they, they, of course, have to find a way to make enough money to survive. So um, they have developed this business making children's toys and also furniture for handicapped people. And they do both of those things at a very high quality, but they're still marketing them. You know, they're beautiful things, right? But they're marketing them and selling them in the larger capitalist economy. 
So, you know, communities like that are like the, in the book, New Clairvaux and uh, Rosemont, I think was, an, or I forget exactly, but, you know, the, these small communities that um, folks tried to create, they did the same thing. They, they tried to make a living from the capitalist economy, even right. while trying to separate themselves from it. Is that not a part of the reason why they eventually don't work or they get slowly sucked back into what they don't like? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, that's, I think that's totally part of it, right? And, but it's, but it's, it's like, where do you place the fall and or how do you get around it? Which I mean, this is probably, if you had this answer, we probably wouldn't be where we are. Um, mm -hmm. Because, right, like if you're making something like a really expensive children's toy or whatever, right? who is the market going to be for this, right? right. I mean, if I can take my, I, I don't even want to say, I, I don't actually have children. So I like, if I, if, if, you know, 20 years from now, I take my child, right, to like, wherever, Walmart, and, you know, get him or her, you know, some cheap toy off the shelf, right? Um, versus going and, you know, because I'm probably not going to be rich. I mean, we're just going to assume this right now. If I am great, you know, I'll go buy the expensive one. Right. But I mean, most people aren't going to be able to spend like a hundred bucks on, you know, a handcrafted, um, you know, doll or action figure or whatever the heck it is. Right. right. So, so it's part of this question, I guess, of, right. Like, if you're going to be producing these high quality goods and selling them at a large price, right. Rather than just contributing to this already existing kind of social hierarchy and or like, right. Division of wealth, right. Can you use, right. Those products that you sell to the Uber wealthy and or the elite, right. Like, can you use that to then slowly start like either like expanding your community or, um, you know, placing these funds somewhere else, right? So like, like how, how can you use this as a step to then, like use the selling of these goods at a very high price as a step to then being able to, right, produce some sort of greater societal transformation where the average Joe or Jane or whoever, right, uh, or Jude, uh, you know, can afford them. Mm -hmm. So this, I think, is the kind of like, hump right yeah and and i guess so, i would say even even let's say that these things don't cost you know maybe they're not a hundred dollar dolls or, or action figures but maybe they're like twenty dollar action figures but they're still so even beyond the cost of things that communities like this might produce because they put so much time and labor into them mm -hmm. um there's also just the aesthetic, which, and I think that the chapters kind of bring this out too, like the type of people who are attracted to a handcrafted toy or basket or vase are probably of the middle and upper classes. Right. They just are. They're, you know, who goes around shopping for decor or thinking about the aesthetic, you know, appeal of an item relative to others in their houses other than people who already have quite a bit of things and have the time and leisure to think about ambiance basically right yeah i mean or who, who goes to the microbrewery instead of getting a six pack of coors you know right exactly <laughs> right and it's not just about money although money's a part of it it's also just you know i mean think about the uh, the relative leisure that some people have over others to even think about and develop certain tastes or get into this or that type of beer or coffee or whatever it may be. Um, and so there, there is, I, you know, you're right. There's kind of like a inherently, uh, there's an inherent class based appeal to this that right. kind of doomed it from the start, but the type of people who are into these types of activities or to buying things that the, the arts and crafts people might make are not the, are not largely not the working class, even though there's a real affinity for 
within the ideology, you know, and there is this idea that somehow they're going to take this and they're going to kind of use it as the launching pad to transform society more, you know, wholesale. Um, yeah, but, I'm, I don't know that, like, like to go back to the example of this, I, I think it was William Morris, right? Like the press, mm -hmm. right? Like these super expensive, like they're, I've seen pictures of these texts and they're, they're just like, they're gorgeous, you know, like, um, you know, like hand scripted uh, and like, um, you know, the lettering, uh, like images, you know, that like, like individual <laughs> like images that somebody painted or drew or whatever, right? In each book, right? But, and the dream is that this would be what all books are like, you know, instead of like, you know, a cheap paperback that's like falling apart just because I've read it twice. Um, so that, I don't know, it's, it's, it's very difficult, right? But, but it's like, can you, like, how can you get over the hump of having only a small market for these things, right? And I think what it requires is not just economic transformation, right? But but also like sociocultural or probably like sociopolitical would be better transformation. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you had a place like you, you mentioned this new harmony, which I also know nothing about. Right. But, but say you had one of these, you know, kind of like weird commune <laughs> type places, which, um, you know, they're, they're not all weird. I shouldn't say this, but right. Like a commune, they're, they're somewhat impractical, but right. Say you had one of this where, um, one person made all the tables or furniture or whatever, and another person made bread or, you know, or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, where, where you could kind of have, I mean, to me, this is like the, we both read that book uh, on the parish commune, right? Yeah. This is like the communal luxury, mm -hmm. um, right? But so, so it would take some sort of like socio-political organization, right? running in tandem with the economic shift, right? Yeah, I mean, that vision is, is that people won't be making things to sell to capitalists. They'll be, they'll be making things for each other. That that's a, seems quite different, right? Like, right, yeah. And if we take it like the labor theory of value, like at its word, right, then something that requires more labor Right, like, like I will be able to only produce one table in X amount of times. In that same amount of times, you will be able to bake. Wow, this is a super gendered example. Sorry for that, everyone. <laughs> That's um, okay. I bake for it. That's all right. I also make furniture sometimes. <laughs> yeah, you'll you'll be able to make like you know ten loaves of bread or whatever. Right. Yeah. And I'm curious, right? Like how this translates though into, um, like over to, I don't know how, how to say this, right? The, the issue I want to get at is, right, will eventually the table maker have made enough furniture for everyone in this commune or whatever the heck it is, mm -hmm. right? And then has nothing to do, right? And then this is another hurdle, you know? Yeah, I mean, I guess in a practical sense, people would just have to shift to what was needed at a certain point. You know, there's always this ideal that in a community like that, people will be able to choose exactly what they're gonna do. But I think the reality of human life would probably dictate otherwise. And if you got done making your furniture, but you know, Joe Farmer needed the harvest to come in, you'd probably be over there, you know? Right, right. And, and this is another reason the communities tend to break down is that they do ultimately kind of expect people to to work quite a bit, you know, like at least a full day. It may be in a very different setting where, you know, like you're with people that you know and can enjoy their company and you have a say in how things are done, but you're still going to be working. And I think maybe a lot of the folks that joined these experimental communities back in the 19th century and early 20th century maybe didn't expect that, that work. Right. Mm. Yeah. so like I don't know like we sort of so let's before we leave the topic of beauty let's talk about this a little bit more and make sure we we are kind of on the same page so I mean to me why the emphasis on beauty I think 
and it may be a mistake. I think you're right. I like the argument that you made, but I think part of it is also that beauty is something that should not be utilitarian in their view, that if it is not utilitarian, if it's simply an expression for its own sake, that it's kind of a liberating thing. Does that make sense? Right. And that what capitalism does is it takes beauty and it commodifies it and it turns it into a product. But beauty should should be something that's freely expressed and doesn't have any other end other than itself. Yeah, I, so I don't know if that's like what they would go for. like. I think that the beauty is stressed, but it's also like beauty and utility. Um, okay. Like... Uh, on 298, they say, like, they're insisting on the erasure of the lines between delight and utility. The anarchist and arts and crafts movements back into a world populated by uh, Walt Whitman's friendly companions, a paradise of people and things, a realm of earthly enchantment. Right. And, like, when, when I think of the arts and crafts movement, right, I don't think of, like, so much art for art's sake, um, at least not as, as the goal. I think of... Um, Right, like, why is this? Why this drinking glass, right, instead of a, like, beautiful one, right? So, like, it's it's the combination of utility and beauty, right? So, like, instead of having mass-produced bookshelves or mass-produced desks, or you know, um, uh, M William Morris's big thing was wallpaper, right? <laughs> like, instead of having this this like mass produced, I mean, and it's not that that's mass produced, but kind of like shoddy, ugly, yeah. like wallpaper, yeah. right? Why can't it just be like super ornate or, you know, or beautiful or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like taking these useful items and beautifying them. Right. Mm -hmm. Which also has to do with, right. Like, and, and not just beautifying them, but like kind of trying to undo the beauty use, um, like dichotomy. Right where you can have something that's beautiful, like a desk, right? That's beautiful and you can use it every day and it'll still last for, you know, you know, hundreds of years, you know, um, excluding things like a fire or whatever, right? So it's, it's kind of like this dual, right? I, I guess this is how I think of it. It's like a bringing together mm -hmm. um, because like the art for art's sake, right? This is where you get into I mean, like modernist art, which comes, I mean, this comes later, right? But, but it's, yeah, it, it's, it's different. Um, okay. I see. Yeah, this would, this would be like, um, I'm trying to think, you know, some, like, I don't think, th I don't think they would be against this, I guess I should say. Yeah, I right? think but, but that's, yeah. that's probably true. I think this is kind of a view of beauty that, that I've run across elsewhere, you know, that beauty is, it is holy or it can be, it can be a conduit to the holy because it can be simply nothing but it's itself, it's expression. But I, I think you're right about the um, arts and crafts movement actually. Um, so like, so we've kind of knocked down um, the notion that, that aesthetics should be the, the main thing. Um, so like, what's your overall assessment of them then did in their concept of work um basically would you say you know they were they were just doomed to fail and this is not is not a way an avenue that you can get back to any degree of valid enchantment yeah um so I would not say that they were like doomed from the outset to fail. Yeah. Um, and I actually, I'm, I'm really, I tend to be very sympathetic um, to the arts and crafts movement. Like I really enjoy reading uh, like William Morris and John Ruskin. Uh, these are the only people I've read from this, mm -hmm. um, but, but I really enjoy reading this and also like more can like the contemporary craft movements. There's like the journal of modern craft and there's like, I mean, there's even like a craft reader, which is, you know, like contemporary scholars on craft. Um, and, and I enjoy reading this, this stuff, but mainly for the, like the labor aspect of it, right? Like, cause it's a recasting of labor, 
Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like, to a certain extent, right, instead of focusing on labor time, which is inherently quantitative, right, it, it would focus on labor quantity, uh, not labor, labor quality, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so this is, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to this because, I mean, like Morrison Ruskin and these arts and crafts people, like, I mean, I hate looking at Walmart box stores and, uh, you know, as I think it was actually Ruskin, like, you know, like, like, why is it that we have to go to Venice or something to like go see a beautiful city? Um, you know, mm -hmm. if we want to see like great architecture, why can't we just, you know, why can't I walk out my door and see that instead of see, <laughs> seeing like block buildings um, that are just, cool. you know, dull, basically. So what's the connection there that, you, you know, like, what is it that you're saying here um, that labor quality cannot equal a big box store that labor quality cannot equal a, um, I don't know, a McDonald's cup uh, or, you know, what, what is, what do we mean by labor quality and how would that make, um, make people's experience of life better than it is? Right. So, it, I mean, so, so the beauty element is still there. Right. But I guess I would also stress like the, I, I, I phrase it as like care, mm -hmm. like, right. Like you get this sense that on some items, it's like somebody just was like, yeah, I need a desk. So like, what is a desk? It's four pieces of wood made, making a rectangle. Right. And this is like all, all the more thought that went into it. Oh, we're going to, you know, it's like, Oh, and desks are usually brown. So this like ground up, you know, wood chips and cardboard that we've packed in with a bunch of glue to make this particle board. We'll put some like brown wood, like, I don't even know what it is, like coating or something on the outside, right? To make it actually look like wood, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think which, that's called it, laminate. Yeah, 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 laminate. And it's, I, there's like, there's no care that went into this object. Um, so like when I say quality over quantity in terms of labor, right? Like quality labor is invested with care, which I would define this as you, you like a concern for not only the item as it exists now, but also what it will become. Right. So this would be like, I mean, this totally destroys any notion of planned obsolescence. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you pair this pair, then you have to pair this right with the notion of, of beauty. Um, and then that's where you get something that I think is actually closer in practice to the sentiment that like the arts and crafts movement expressed in theory. So, okay. so to be clear, I, I should say that like when I say that I think they overemphasized like beauty and the aesthetics, this I don't think was there like, like theoretically, I don't think this was there aim but in hmm. practice this is what ended up happening okay that makes sense because you know they do get it doesn't take long for them to get kind of sucked up into a, a kind of market in which they are you know selling these beautiful items and kind of making a living off of them and then that gets commercialized but i too sense that that was not their that's not that wasn't their original goal and they're no. Right. their purpose it got it got perverted um so the so quality work why is this okay so i i'm just kind of interested in your view on quality work and and to relate it back to mccarahare's if we can to mccarahare's um concern for enchantment mm -hmm. right is there a connection there could they have achieved like a sort of sacramentality in their work had they focused, continued to focus in reality on quality work. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, so, and this is where it's, again, so like, this is where I think the aestheticization of this, like, of kind of the enchantment that the arts and crafts people were going for, like, became aestheticized, which I think was to their detriment. Because, right, where is the sacred, where is the sacramental? Right? Is it in the like, you know, the aesthetic experience of these objects, or is it in the matter of these, like, like the very materiality, you know, the thingness, the stuffness of these objects mm -hmm. themselves, right? 
And if it's in the very thingness and stuff, you know, if it's in the matter, if it's matter itself that is sacred, right? Because, you know, God created it, right? Um, right. So it's kind of imbued with this godliness, right? Or this sacramentality, um, right? Then this is where any engagement with that matter is going to be care hyphen full, right? Mm-hmm. You know, right? Because, you because, be because you're dealing with something that God created. Exactly, right. Yeah. So, so this, we sh- I, sh- I should have started like, right? We should have started at this point and then gone into my whole <laughs> other spiel, right? Because it's kind of this like, this ontological underpinning, right? Of like, where do you place the godliness? Where do you place right, the sacramentality or whatever. I don't even know if that's a word, to be honest. It is. Um, I right, think so. <laughs> right. where, where do you even, where, you know, where do you place this? Is it in the aesthetic experience itself or is it in the matter itself? And if it's in just the aesthetic experience, right, then, you know, you just want to produce something that's beautifying. You know, you don't actually, like the quality of labor doesn't matter as much, right? If it's in the matter itself, right, your engagement with the material world Right. So we can think of like, I mean, even something like, like, was it, uh, you know, John Locke's thing where he's like, oh, you mix your labor with, you know, the earth or whatever. And this is where value comes from. Right. Mm -hmm. Then all value would actually be kind of like sacred value Mm -hmm. in a certain sense. Right. And all products would be sacred because all engagements with the material world would be sacred. And this would be an enchanted reality. Right. So that's kind of yeah and and it's it's when you like aestheticize this um you know you you if if the material world itself and matter is 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 where the sacred or you know or where god lies right and it's kind of like um you know kind of the majesty of god right this is where this lies or something um then of course um you know your engagements with it are going, not only are they going to be careful, right? But what you produce from this is going to be beautiful, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, because, because one, um, it's kind of like the chain of reasoning. You start from the sacred matter. You have to have careful engage, engagements with it. This is the quality labor. And then mm-hmm. what you're going to produce is something beautiful because, um, right, you're engaging with godliness, right, in a way that you know, is respectful of that godliness and caring of it, right? Yeah. So, if you start with this, to, yeah. It's closer to platonic beauty because it's a beauty that has to do with its goodness. Um, so, you know, like even, let's say, a farmer, you know, digging up his uh, compost with, you know, a bunch of worms in it, it's going to produce in abundance, right? It's 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 got a certain beauty because of its goodness. And similarly, you know, you know, when you pull a baby out, um, it's beautiful, uh, but not at, you know, it doesn't look too beautiful at first, but you see the beauty in it because of its goodness, because it's part of the creation, because it's part of all of that of life. Right. I mean, um, we're, you know, it's, it's godliness, right? Yeah. Which, right. So, so that's, yeah. And, uh, then, then it leads to the question of, right, like the corruption of things, right, which would be the workings of evil, mm-hmm. you know, and or, um, you know, I mean, there's, uh, right, what is, what's the quote from the Communist Manifesto? I can't, you know, the one about like, uh, you know, it takes, capitalism takes all that is solid, melts into air, and then right immediately after that, because this is the one that everyone always Something says. Something about right, flipping away the veils of illusions of I, I can't remember it's, it's like something it's like it takes all that is sacred and makes it profane yeah yeah right right so so i mean this totally stands out right like like if there's this godliness and matter which requires right you know you would approach it in the manner in which you would approach god right mm-hmm. when you approach it in a way that is brash or you know, ruthlessly greedy or whatever else, right? This this is going to produce something that is is ugly and that is bad, right? If we like buy into this ontology, which I totally have not squared away with, um, like like all of my other like, you know, like what would Deleuze say about this? Probably nothing good. 
Um, but you know, we're just going to roll with it. Well, that's why compartmentalizing can be good sometimes. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I, I'll just like live in contradiction. Um, I wanted to make a point about Locke since you'd make, you'd mentioned him a while back in Locke's second treatise, you can see the blasphemy, the shift from this notion of, um, you know, this is God's world when you mix your labor with it, it you sort of are using that material. So you need to be responsible for it. You need to take care. But then there's this point fairly early on in that story uh, that he tells of the state of nature where money is invented. And when money is invented, it separates, you know, like labor from product. Okay. Right. And, and from then on, um, there's this, there's this sort in order to grow bigger and to improve nature and to make it better than it was and to kind of, in a sense, it becomes domination. You, you have to continue to distance yourself, you know, and you, you as the capital, the person with the capital can hire all these people, expand your, you know, and this and that. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon um, Locke is sanctioning the exact opposite of what he first says, you know, in the state of nature, that God, it's God's world, right? And at, at one point, he says that nine tenths, I think it's nine tenths of its worth is in is made by human labor. Um, and, <laughs> and then you combine that with money and you know, with enter the enterprising mentality, and basically, it becomes worthless without without a real enterprising you know um more or less capitalist to know what to do with it that's why Locke said that the native americans were just you know they they were wasting what god had given them in the new world right right yeah well and this is where so this is totally going to end up straying me even further from like my area of you know actual knowledge um so so this is like probably going to be totally wrong right but also right i'm thinking of you know like so this like wanes theological to an extent but um is it there's a story in the new testament about oh gosh i can't remember the person's name this is terrible i hope my parents don't watch this um of, of, of the woman washing Jesus' feet with her hair, right? Oh, wasn't it um, was Mary? It, yeah, Mary. I, I was going to say if it was Mary or Martha. Mary Magdalene, Mary. maybe? Or, oh, yeah, maybe somebody different. I, yeah, I don't know. But, but anyways, I guess. Okay, we'll go yeah, with who, um, Like recognizing that I'm probably totally wrong. So somebody correct me in the comments or something. Um, uh, right? Like. Is this was this person doing washing Jesus's feet to make a buck, right, or was it out of the the awe, right, or out of the godliness, right there? Mm -hmm. And I think, right, if we think about this in terms of like what you were saying about Locke and also the Native Americans, it's a question of like I don't want to do this, but it's it's kind of like a question of ends, right? Like like when when you're approaching God. Um, are you approaching him for yourself? Right. Like, you know, like, 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 or, or, or for what reason are you approaching God? And I think this question also comes um, to the material world, right? If you're approaching it um, right out of like, like full of love and care, right. Out of its godliness. Right. Or, or are you approaching it in this way to make a buck off of it? Right. And this I think is where the thing about lock and money comes in. Right. Because, um, right, basically, he, he's, he, he totally stresses, I mean, he doesn't use the term, right, because this comes later, I mean, with Marx, but, like, exchange value. Um, and it's, right, like, so are you producing things for their exchange value, you know, so are you engaging with, like, basically sacred matter, right, to generate some form of exchange value, right? And this would be, like... I mean, this, this like brings up, you know, the notion of like the Pharisees or something, right? You know, like these, these rulers who were totally not open, right? To like literally the son of God when he came uh, kind of thing. So 
I don't really know what I'm trying to say. But basically, basically, right, like if you approach it in the same way that you approach God, right, exchange value is out of the question, right? And I think this is why, I mean, if we bracket the question of whether or not Native Americans, you know, whatever their religion is, right? Because, you know, since it's, you know, the Christian God, right, this raises all sorts of issues for dealing with other religions, which we don't want to deal with at this time. Not at this but, point, but it's right. But, but so, so let's just, you know, say that the God of the Native Americans is the same as a Christian God. Okay. Um, just for just the sake of the example, right? And they're approaching this matter matter because it is sacred, right? And this is embedded in their myths and everything else, right? And, and they're approaching it in this way, um, like to honor it, um, you know, and it's going to generate, you know, like basically, you know, probably literally like fruits for them, right? Mm -hmm. um, like contrast this totally with, you know, someone like Cecil Rhodes or, you know, or some, like I'm thinking of some like rich white colonial man uh, mm -hmm. who like enters and like just destroys everything. Why? You know, because I needed to make a railroad track from the, you know, from this mine to my port so I could take this shit and sell it, you know, abroad right Total, so totally for exchange value right right and so so, so i haven't worked this out obviously but but yeah i don't know if if you have thoughts at this point you know help me help me make this something that isn't uh wild I think, coaster, you're, so. I think you're at least channeling mccara here because i you know i as i've read this book i've tried to figure out like what's you know what's he really kind of promoting and if, if I had to guess at this point, it would be that um, early Christian understanding um, was communistic in a way. That early Christian understanding was that um, people would use uh, the things of the earth to help themselves and each other, but not to exploit or to like make profit or to you know, kind of just grow for the sake of growth and, and all of these things, right? right. Um, and so um, literally from that perspective, doing what this person does when he runs a railroad through, you know, the wilderness, I guess, just to make, just to make a buck right, yeah. um, is, is a type of, it's a type of blasphemy or a sin of sorts. Now that may sound really extreme and impractical and it probably is impractical. And maybe you could even say that there might be a, a good reason for running a railroad if it was run for different reasons. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right, like yeah. it's not necessarily an anti-technological perspective. It's an, it definitely though is an anti-profit perspective. Yeah, right. And this, I mean, this would be, um, this totally fits, right? Because it's, it's like, th this is black, like the notion of blasphemy is what I'm picking up, right? Because this would be another, this, this would be like approaching matter for not, like, as if it were, uh, you know, for another God, right? Mm -hmm. This, you know, this is, this is like the golden calf, literally. Um, you know, wow. you know, I mean, that's, that's what, you know, do you approach matter out of its love and it's, you know, and it's godliness and, you know, with this in mind, and is this why your care, you know, you, you, your care, you know, care hyphen full, you know, like I said, um, right. you know, with it, or, um, you know, if you're approaching it for the profit motive or whatever, right, this would be, um, right, like, like matter would be sacred, but it wouldn't be godly you know, it's, it's sacred to a different God kind of thing. Yeah, right. It becomes a, it becomes the means of making an idol. I mean, again, like the whole book seems to tell this story of people time and time again. It's almost like you're reading the Old Testament, you know, how, you know, Hebrews were always kind of straying from God. And when they did, they made a golden right. calf, right? Right. So like, back in early America, you know, the original Puritans had a pretty, I don't know, like they were really harsh and I don't like them, but they, <laughs> but they had a pretty squared away notion that, you know, labor was going to be for helping the community. But then pretty shortly after, you know, they arrive, it starts to kind of morph into 
you know, hard work is the measure of a, of a man and, you know, like productivity is, and then, you know, God blesses productivity and pretty soon productivity is a, is a sign of God's blessing. And then we're off on the way to like, you know, ever expanding uh, market, market economics and, and the Christian imprimatur is put on that. Right. And so now they've built an idol and in a way, um, the, this story of the arts and crafts movement in a miniature does the same thing. They start out with this very pure idea, but then they kind of through, you know, using, using God as a means of justification, they kind of slowly, God and beauty and things like that, slowly kind of morph into an enterprise, right? Yeah. And, and then they've got an idol again, you know, whether it's beauty or profit or both. Yeah, it's so, okay. So there's one other point on this, which I think is like actually two other points. One is actually super useful, and one I just want to raise like at the end um, to basically like scapegoat myself. Um, you know, like the good academic I try to be. Um, but the okay. one I wanted to raise now is like I think talking in this way without discussing Max Weber's Protestant ethic uh, is problematic. Hmm. So I wanted to raise this, right? And I think why, right? So, so how does what we're talking about not end up in vast accumulation? You know, so, like, like basically what uh, Max Weber describes uh, in the Protestant ethic, where, you know, your occupation is, you know, you're called by God to your occupation. You serve him uh, through your work, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't... I, this is probably going to be, you know, raise more issues than I've already probably like flirted with in this whole thing, which is just me flirting with issues the whole time. But um, I think that here, right, what was held sacred was work instead of matter, right? And if you hold your own work more sacred, right, then like the, you know, then, then the creation of God, right? Like, you know, you know, the materiality of things, Mm -hmm. right? Then this is, this is like a form of self-worship almost, right? And I, and I think that this would be, I mean, and this is terrible because I'm Lutheran, right? Probably, but um, I mean, this, this is the issue probably with the Protestant ethic. I mean, if we, I mean, I don't know, I'm still not sure how I said this, but I'm saying like, if we follow McCarrahare out, this might be one way he would explain it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. Because, you know, at the center of this, of his understanding of kind of God's interface with the world is this Eucharistic sacramentality. And mm-hmm. so what that means to a Catholic, and he is a Catholic, is, is you know, the Eucharist is literally this um, physical embodiment of God on earth. And the way that it happens is definitely from God to man, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not that a priest makes bread and somehow, you know, makes it holy and brings God into it. It's definitely God doing the action, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that to a certain extent, the if if you make the mistake that the labor is sacred and then you, you sort of go from there, that it's kind of similar to saying, the priest makes it holy. Right. Yeah. Um, like okay. the fetishization of the church instead of God kind of. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. right. It's yeah. I mean, this, yeah. it's a mistake. It's a mistake that the church, as you just pointed out, has done time and time again, or, right. or if they haven't always done it, definitely people who people in the church have done it and have seen the priest as this almost like magician that, you know, makes these sacred things happen but that's not actually what's what's happening and it's it's always a mistake so then in that case you make the church the idol right i mean it's it's like right when you engage with the material world right you can think of this as kind of like communing with god right or being in communion with god uh right uh like through your engagement with the material world right but that doesn't come like you said right that doesn't come from you engaging with the material world right it comes from God, right? So, and if, if if matter is sacred, right, then we would say that this comes, like, it, it's kind of flipping, right? Um, like, you know, Locke's understanding of value or, or I mean, even Marx's, uh, you know, rather than, 
like the value of things deriving from you, you know you the sole center of the universe as a laborer right uh it comes from the sacredness of the matter right it comes from god the sacredness of the matter mm -hmm. yeah so. so that care that you know you started out um with that word care or sort of like a, a care mentality would create a different stance i would think like of humility and carefulness as you as you said early on like um a, a sense of wanting to work with what is created right rather than working to dominate it or to take it apart and reconstitute it or something like that that you would assume that it's made to be in a certain way that humans shouldn't disrupt but should try to work with as much as possible you know there's this notion some theologians had of, of human beings as kind of co-creators which kind of jibes with this, um, that, you know, a, a, in that capacity, the human being works with God, but not against God, right? So right. they're invited to be a part of creation in that means, but it's problematic or it becomes not that. It becomes mistaken when you take what, what you've been given and you basically distort it in the, in the way that human beings constantly do now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's you know, to, to draw in on like the Eucharist example that you said, right? Like, it would be like, do you go and do you think of this as the, you know, and I'm not Catholic, so you can, you, you can correct this again, right? Like, is this the body and blood of God, right? Or is this um, wine and bread kind of thing, right? And if you're approaching it as this is just wine and bread, right? Or you're approaching this, it as this is wine and bread, which the priest has made into this, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is still, both of these would be examples of prop, like, like, um, like pro problematic engagements with the material world, right? Because mm -hmm. the one would be that, you know, you're just engaging with, you know, this dead, you know, thing, which you can do whatever you want with. And two would be, right, like, the, the, the example of the, you know, uh, you know, this is bread and wine, which a priest has made holy or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, this would be that you, by mixing your labor with this, you know, crap or whatever it is in the material world, you've made it holy by mixing your labor with it, which this is not the case. So yeah, yeah. I, the, um, yeah, the second point that I wanted to say to, to cover, basically cover all of my bases was that, um, some issues with this would be, for example, you know, you could totally employ this theory for colonization, right? Uh, because non-Christian peoples um, would be viewed as, you know, basically, you know, not engaging with, you know, matter in a sacred way, right? Mm -hmm. So, because, so because yeah. from that perspective, they wouldn't understand who had made it just to make sure we understand why. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, okay. that's the thought is like, right. Like if, if, um, you know, a native American is engaging with matter thinking that, you know, it came from whoever, right. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, or, or some, whoever, I mean, it could be anybody, the right. Great, the whole great spirit or, you know, mother earth or. Right. And then, I mean, then you can, John Locke could come in and say, well, um, I'm going to engage with this as the, as, you know, communion with God, right. Which is, you know, which this is the correct way of engaging with it. Right. So, so then this becomes problematic. Yeah. But one, one potential way, right. And then we get into the weeds of, and I'll stop after this one potential way of avoiding this would be right. If you recognize that all matter is made, it's like, right. Like, like, you know, kind of the spirit of God is, is, is breathing in all matter kind of thing. Right. Then you, th then you also have to recognize that human beings are material beings. Right. And if you recognize that human beings are material beings, right. Then call, you know, uh, colonization or imperialism or, you know, any type of this is off the table. Right. Yeah. Of course. This would not be engaging with those human bodies. Right. Right. And this also helps with the, the exploitation of labor factor. Mm -hmm. 
so that's an important p point is that not you know it's you know god is in the material world humans are part of this material world right so that's mm -hmm. the, you have to make that second step because if humans are apart then you still run into these issues of like you know i'm god's child so i can you know go kill and rape or whatever yeah, of course that, you over I mean, there ridiculous so. obviously i mean um you know r rightly understood um christianity couldn't couldn't support that treatment of anything in god's creation right like right yeah there's a mistake a huge mistake um that's been repeatedly made and and you know to give christians a break a lot of other religions have have done the same, you know, like our God is the only God, it's the best God. And, you know, therefore, and then therefore, you know, you all can just be exploited and used because, or destroyed because you don't believe in God. Therefore you're not really human in the same sense and all of this. But, you know, if you understand this whole world is God's creation, <laughs> you, you can't treat other people in it that way any more than you can exploit or mistreat nature so but this yeah. is yeah this is this is a, something that people have constantly done and of course a lot of people are like really put off by religion period for this very reason and right. i can't blame them but i mean the way i look at this is you know in the case in your example of the christian and the native american i genuinely think that we're both believing in basically the same thing you know uh, yeah it's it's different it's different in in the details but yet what what we can agree on is that the world wasn't made by us but by some higher power that we ought to like respect yeah, yeah this would be your i mean this to me is totally like your Jungian, uh <laughs> like it's, yeah like the Jungian influence yeah yeah i yeah. i mean in like to add something to this that you know is is provocative because you know um whatever is that in a certain way this doesn't mean uh holding all life sacred right this is why it's, it's provocative but it, but it means holding webs of life sacred right or life worlds sacred right mm -hmm. so, you know you know so so it's like if it exists existence is precarious right um then like you can't just hold like a single human life sacred right uh you kind of have to hold like the the kind of the web of things um that constitute that life sacred if that makes okay. sense well i mean could you kind of explain that a little more could they be opposed with those two values what like what do you mean the um, um, like holding the individual human life sacred and holding the web of life, a web of life sacred. Right. Yeah. I'm saying like, you can't just hold one individual human life. Like, like I, I should say, you can't hold one human life sacred at the expense of others. If that makes ah, sense. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, that helps. so, so that like, you know, this is where you get over the kind of, um, utilitarian hump of like, you know, uh and and the colonial thing of like right i'm you know oh you know population rise who should we like bomb the shit out of not the christians you know it's like no you shouldn't bomb the shit out of anyone um you know kind of thing so so it's, it's like all lives are equal right in god's eyes kind of thing yeah right? well yeah you do your christianity serious serious harm if you justify destroying other other people just because they don't believe the way you do i've right. never understood um this approach i don't think it you know i just i just think it's another manifestation of human beings desire for power and they hide behind their religion but maybe i'm kind of maybe that's too simplistic a view in a way but that's the I mean, way that I fits with what we said right it would be blasphemous right because if you're doing this right what are you doing this for you like like right to, like what does it take you know say you're like going to like guillotine somebody or something right this is an engagement with the material world right you know so it's so the same way in which we talk about like the blasphemy of like fetishizing one's labor right over like the sacramentality of the of matter um right it would be fetishizing 
kind of one's beliefs over the sacramentality of matter or something like this. I don't, you know, do you get what I'm kind of trying to say? Yeah, yeah, right. Which, well, your beliefs can become very quickly become ideologized. Right, yeah, yeah. They become more about like, here's my 10 things that I have to believe in. And then that gets worked up into people's minds, kind of similar to a political ideology. In fact, the two often become enmeshed, right? So they can't even be pulled apart. And then you get going this us versus them. I've got to like purify. I've got to, I, I'm, I'm justified in, in um, either, you know, like trans transforming them into something like myself or um, getting rid of them. Um, But yeah, ultimately I, I, Christianity in particular strikes me as a religion that ought not to be about nothing but codes and a set of rules Mm -hmm. or, you know, like these five um, principles, you know, it, it's, it strikes me more as a way of life and a practice um, and a relationship. Right. But yeah. I, yeah. 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 I mean, like, like for like this, the, Oh God, there goes the puppy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like the Spanish inquisition, right. Was, was a form of self idolization, right. Because what you hold sacred in this instance is your your own set of beliefs, right, and not the like, not um, you know the godliness of all things, right. So this would be this is kind of a a disenchanted religion. I mean, I mean, right, that's what it is, right. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, so so that's like like the same way in which we talked about like you know. Um, in you know in in terms of production right we can also think about this in terms of violence or war right like the the idolization of the self or one's belief uh right at the expense of you know kind of the glorification of god right in a careful engagement with um you know sacred matter or whatever it is so right i mean just when when you think about the utter destruction of not only human life, but animal and plant life, just the utter destruction that especially modern warfare causes. Um, there's just no way, I, I, I can't imagine justifying it on a Christian basis or on a religious basis. I know people do, you know, fight the infidel, <laughs> whatever. Um, but um, yeah, I, I just, it's, it's uh, talk about ugly. It's ugly. Yeah. Right. Right. It, it couldn't possibly be what, uh, what a just God would, would want. Um, well, let's see. I feel like we've kind of, we've covered quite a bit of ground here. I feel like we've come to this point where we could stop. Um, yeah. Simply because if we went on to another topic, we it'd be a whole nother hour. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. This was a really interesting discussion, although I don't know how close it was to the questions that you posed originally. 